Hello again. Yes, it's me. And this time, it's not TV Doctors I'm going to be talking about. Because uh, as I speak, I'm right in the middle of Tom Baker. I just finished the Talons of Wang Chiang today. So that'll be uh, another three months before I do that video, give or take. No, I'm here to talk about the Peter Cushing Dalek movies. Which, as he doesn't have his own little figure, I can wave at the camera. I'm going to have to wave the Blu-ray cover about. Ooh, that's a limited edition uh, version, which is frankly better than the individual Blu-ray cases, which uh, are rather horrible and don't convey the style of the films at all. Uh, Peter Cushing, of course, is one of the great British actors. Extraordinary performer. Generally, even in the most schlocky, cheap and nasty horror film that he did, his performance was always subtle and nuanced and clever. Uh, apparently, if you saw his own scripts from his films, they would be covered in notes uh, for ideas of what he was going to do with a character in each and every scene. He really put so much thought into everything, whether it was a like, classic, like uh, the original Frankenstein, or something rubbish, like Biggles. You, know, you could swap those two films around, uh, depending on preference. But, uh, you yeah, know, Getting him to play Doctor Who is on the same sort of level of having John Hurt do it for an afternoon. It should be one of the crowning moments of the entire 50 hist year history of a programme. Unfortunately, these two movies feature what may well be the single worst Peter Cushing performances of all time. I have no idea why he decided to play the character as a bow-legged granddad who enjoys winking at people. Uh, it's just genuinely... It's not, it's not a bad performance as such. It's just very much not up to his own standards, very much slightly annoying, and almost completely of no relation to the character of the TV show. And of course, at that point, there had only been the one character in the TV show. So it's odd that it was reinvented quite so drastically. Uh, I suppose the best thing you could say about it is that it, in style, it is slightly proto Troughton. You, know, you couldn't imagine William Hartnell reading the Eagle. You could quite easily imagine the second Doctor doing it, though. Uh, but it's frankly got nothing on what Troughton actually did do with the past. Uh, it's, it's just so disappointing because you go to thinking, yeah, Peter Cushing, this is going to be awesome, and then you watch it and you slowly lose the will to leave every time he just goes around doing that. Uh, it's not a crowding, uh, it's not a great moment for him at all. Uh, the films themselves are in a very strange place uh, in terms of Doctor Who history, of course, they're not part of a TV show. They're remakes of the two team, first two Dalek TV stories, but uh, for years, well, they are still the only classic Doctor Who that ever gets repeated on normal television in the UK. Uh, and certainly, if you grew up in the 90s, that would be what you would see more often. You, know, you would have the occasional BBC Two repeat of a TV show, but generally, the Dalek films would be on once every couple of years. Saturday afternoon on Channel 4. Uh, so, you, there's a lot more familiarity with them, I think, for a lot of people, especially if you grew up in those years without New Doctor Who on TV. Uh, you know them better than you know the TV show because they've just been on so often. Even today, uh, it's not uncommon for, I think it's Channel 5, rather right now, uh, to put one of these films on when a new... TV series of Doctor Who starts to sort of attempt to uh, preempt some viewers away from uh, well, it'll be Peter Capaldi now, but uh, whoever was playing the role at the time. Uh, so they have this sort of big legacy, and you can sort of see that those influences on the TV show as it since it came back. You know, the Daleks look like the Daleks from the film, not from the TV show. The TARDIS interior owes a more really to the, the, the cushy films where it's just all sorts of random junk piled together have a police box doors on the inside uh, if not on a central six sided console uh, they would feel much more like 
uh, the movie TARDIS than the, uh, the TV TARDIS. So it's, it's had design influences, uh, things like rails have uh, popped up in uh, other places as well. So it's, uh, it's sort of had this big visual legacy on the show. But tellingly, Peter uh, Cushing's performance uh, itself has never had much of an impact on the series. Uh, the films are interesting about they're the only real substantial out of continuity Doctor Who fiction, or at least the only stuff that doesn't pretend to at least vaguely be about a TV show. Uh, certainly, in terms of uh, perform Doctor Who, uh, there could be a few audios, uh, the, sort of what if style audios, uh, maybe a couple of books, but generally, this is the only stuff that is not set in the world of a TV show. And it is interesting to see how they set up uh, the world in a different way. Uh, for those who don't know, in the 1960s, and 70s, uh, I suppose it sort of going back at least as far as the Quatermass films in the 50s, uh, because in Britain there was no syndication market, uh, no real repeats, uh, you would get, if there was a successful TV show, it would usually get a film version, uh, that, so a lot of times it would just be remakes of TV episodes, sort of uh, like the Dad's Army film, that a couple of episodes stuck together, basically, uh, with some new framing sequences of quite a mass films, a cut-down versions of TV stories. Uh, I mean, you, you get the odd original film as well, like uh, Are You Being Served, the movie, uh, the, uh, the two Stato films. Uh, it was a big industry because those were sort of the only ways fans of the show could go and experience uh, adventures again. Yeah, that's the difference between British, British TV and America now, sort of in America, because there was syndication and repeats, uh, films and TV shows very rarely happened up until uh, really Star Trek. You sort of, you had the Batman film in the 60s, other than that, pretty much uh, none at all, at least a uh, main theatrical release anyway. Uh, a lot of shows in the 70s where pilots would get released abroad in Europe. Uh, but generally, America didn't do this sort of thing at the time. It's a sort of big British thing, take a TV show and turn it into a film. Uh, unlike uh, the sitcom films, there's none of the original cast in this, uh, except for some of the Dalek operators, I think. Uh, because, of course, we were making the TV show for most of the year at this point, so they couldn't have got hold of William Hartnell anyway. Uh, but ironically, this could have been potentially the chance him to really give a flawless performance in uh, the medium of uh, film, with the chance of multiple takes and rehearsals. But instead, we get Peter Cushing, uh, you get Ray Castle, and you get, uh, I should really, uh, Roberta Tovey. I probably mangled her name badly, as uh, Susan. And uh, the second one, uh, Macy Ward Castle, you get Bernard Cribbins. Uh, you also get a couple of women playing both Barbara and a blatant Barbara substitute. In the second one, uh, both of whom are completely forgettable. Uh, but as I said, Peter Cushing's not terribly brilliant. Roy Castle, who's sort of one of his, well, he's one of a few 1970s children's TV presenters you could still like. Uh, at least at the time where I am recording this. Uh, yeah, we love the record breakers, play the trumpet, uh, dancing around the statue in TV centre. Unfortunately, his performance here is terrible as well. Again, especially compared to uh, William Russell. Uh, it's sort of when you've got the Doctor being a slapstick comedy character, you don't really need Ian to be a slapstick comedy character as well. And we have a weird situation where it's Susan being the serious sort of heart of the film, and Roberta is actually quite good uh, for a child actor, probably less annoying than TV Susan anyway, uh, and certainly uh, her and Peter Cushing do have some good chemistry, uh, but unfortunately that means, except her, all the regulars are not as good as their TV counterparts, uh, at least in the first film. Uh, but the first film does have go for this, is it's sort of big white screen colour, uh, more impressive sets. Uh, it's condensed. The TV version of the Daleks at seven episodes does have a lot of blatant padding. 
I think you lose about half at least. Uh, oh, here's me double checking. Uh, well, probably about more than half actually uh, of running time. You all have all that jumping back and forth over a cliff. Uh, the final gets to be a bit more exciting and explosive. Uh, so it's a good looking film, but at least my sons of six scenes. But the Daleks look fantastic. You could see well why when the TV series came back, the basic uh, idea they had of the Dalek design was take that, paint it bronze, that'll do. Uh, but because the characters are likeable and the fouls of the TV version, they're you just kind of want the Daleks to kill all of them anyway. Uh, and that remains the same for the film. Uh, so there's no one really to root for. Uh, but it's fast, it's breezy. But ultimately I think you are better off just watching the TV version, despite uh, it being longer and more padded, simply because it takes it more seriously, it's better acted, and it's more iconic, you know, it's Change television. That story, this movie did not change cinema, but it was very successful, uh, leading to the sequel, Dalek Invasion Earth 2150 AD. Uh, this one is not only considerably better than the first film, I would say it is better than the TV version. I was just waiting to get struck by lightning there. Uh, the TV version. It's got its iconic location shots, but it's in, in, it is in so many ways. Like most of the uh, Richard Martin directed stories, uh, looking cheap, nasty, uh, pure B-movie stuff. But, uh, yeah, it's not web planning bad, but it's not as good as the novelisation. Uh, the film has the advantage of actually being a B-movie, so you can sort of forgive its B-movie plot a lot more. Uh, it's got Bernard Cribbins in it being brilliant. All, you know, he's played it funny, again, but uh, his sense of comedic timing, I think it's just better than Roy Castles, frankly. Uh, you know, the silly stuff like when he's having lunch with the Robo Men is played to perfection. But also, it's, uh, it's a darker film, uh, then a bit more serious. The location work is fantastic. The model work is brilliant. The flight saucer is still one of the best flight saucers of all time. Uh, the ending is still silly, but it thinks it's bigger with all the Daleks getting sucked off into the mine. Uh, it's just a lot more fun and a lot more uh, entertaining than the TV version, a lot more should than the first film. Uh, the only real negative thing about the second film is that uh, it makes me want to eat sugar puffs. Uh, yeah, product placements, I'm generally fine with in films, you know, the money gets some made, film movies made, uh, having real logos on stuff in the background, adds a bit of very similitude to things, uh, but when you're in the far future there is nothing but adverts of sugar puffs everywhere, that, that, uh, that's not terribly well done product placement at all. Uh, I just feel like a bowl now, if, I, if I'd have been together I would have had one here for the video and I'd be eating it now. Uh, but I'm nothing if not amateurish in my attempts to entertain on YouTube. Uh, generally, both uh, second film's great, first one's awful. Uh, the setup is odd, if that makes a bit jettison basically all of the backstory from the TV show, apart from the fact his name is Doctor Who, and he has a time machine that looks like a police box. Uh, it looks like a police box for absolutely no reason at all. In the films, uh, but you don't even touch on that. You could have just built it in his shed. Uh, no, you built it in a police box. Why? You never really understand this. Uh, it's a shame because a police box prop is fantastic, big and huge and solid. Again, very influential on the new series. Uh, probably better than any of the police box props, is, props the TV show had until the 80s. Uh, the only real form of it is the doors opening outwards, which of course, you know, that, that stops them getting in in the second one. Uh, if that had been a TV police box, we could have just opened the doors inwards and stuck in under the girder. That, that is a lesson there. Uh, if anyone ever randomly is thinking of randomly building a police box into a time machine out there, that's what you've got to think of. Uh, 
as long as it is all works for the reverse of a Paul McGann film, in that that really dumps all the mythology of the team of the TV series on you in the first five minutes. Uh, well, Smith's there yeah, is it. He's Doctor Who. That that is. That is granddaughter Susie Who, and his other granddaughter Barbara Who. Where, where's Mrs. Who? That that is what I would like to know. But uh, so that's strange, and possibly that's what leads to his very Peter Cushing's very odd performance because of someone who really tried to find the nuances in his characters, the complete and utter absence of any backstory for big screen Doctor Who. Uh, must have made it quite hard for him. Uh, but yeah, generally, these are mildly interesting curios. If you're watching this in the UK, they will be on Channel 5 at some point within the next two years. Uh, so it's worth keeping your eye out for them. Uh, I imagine Blu-ray is probably dirt cheap now. Uh, there's a, quite a good documentary about Dalek Mania on there. Uh, sort of, you, it's a shame because the second one was so good. Uh, but they didn't go on to do more. Uh, but of course it made much less money than the first one because uh, the whole Dalek Mania thing was over by that point. Uh, because, you know, the chase could have been interesting. Uh, that could have really been fun with a proper big budget. You know, they could have even had a robot Doctor Who who looked like Doctor Who. Um, imagine that. Just, just imagine that. What a wonderful thing that could have been. But the... Uh, yeah, it never happened because of lack of money. Weirdly, uh, this is a totally uh, insane and random thing. Peter Cushing did make a radio pilot uh, for a series of radio adventures of Doctor Who. Uh, it no longer exists, but uh, there's some paperwork out there for it. Uh, that's just slightly baffling. Maybe he could have uh, yeah, been a bit better on the radio than he was in the film. But uh, sadly, we'll never know that. That's sort of one of the more obscure uh, lost uh, bits of Doctor Who mythology. But uh, generally, you know, if you catch them on TV, they pass an hour and a half in an entertaining enough way. But uh, then, well, the second one, as I said, is better, but it, it's, it's a TV story. But overall, they are not the equal of the best of a TV series. Uh, but even modern TV series, uh, it's worse Dalek stories where they're being blown up by Catherine Tate typing up them. Uh, they're generally a bit more solid than the films. But uh, Bernie Cribbins for the win. Philip Maddock in the second one as well. You know, the, what a, another great British actor. And uh, he absolutely sells his part of a dodgy black market dealer. Uh, but he's probably, in fact, the best thing in both films, I would say, uh, Philip Maddock is. Uh, that's sort of a lovely little uh, five-minute role. But overall... Well, if you've been watching them on TV, on ITV, in 1977, uh, with eating sugar puffs, you'd have been entertained. Otherwise... Stick with Tom, you, should, you were better off sticking with Tom Baker, which I will be for my uh, next video. Looking at the longest lasting Doctor of them all, most episodes, most stories, the iconic one, uh, the one who came back for the 50th anniversary special. Is he actually any good? Well, we'll find out once I get to the end of season 18. Uh, other than that, I'm going to go find some sugar puffs and eat them all down.